All right, good to see you again. Um, and welcome to this uh, guest lecture. Uh, we have Mr. Olaf Hermansen here from a foundation called Norstella. Uh, the subject for today is a mix of various issues. Uh, a little bit about Inca terms, a little bit about customs clearance and transport law. And uh, so um, we'll take it as it comes. Uh, just before we start, uh, I know that a uh, couple of you have sent me materials for comments. Uh, I will respond to that fairly soon. So if any of the other students have something related to the hand-in in this class that you want to, me to respond to, this is a good time to do it, uh, not the last day before your submission. I'm uh, also at the college next week, but after that I will be leaving for a two-week uh, traveling. Uh, or a trip. So if you want to see me in person, next week is the last option. Okay, then I'd like to leave the floor to you. Let's, let's just attach the mic to you. Put it on the room. Can I use it as a... Good afternoon everybody. My name is Olaf Hermansen. I'm working for this foundation uh, called Nostella. Our um, business is really to work with electronic communications, especially with standard electronic communication, but also with international trade facilitation. That has to do with the fact that I worked for, um, for quite a long time for the Norwegian Trade Council with the export and uh, what is now called Innovation Norway. I've also been working for Keen and Nagel, as you may know, one of the biggest logistics service providers in the world. And now I'm in uh, this foundation called Nostella. So um, I also uh, have a degree in, um, in logistics um, from uh, Handelshögskolen B, uh, Business Administration School in Oslo. So, uh, but what struck me then, uh, also after having been editor of the Norwegian Shippers Handbook for 11 years that the things I'm going to talk about now, it seems to be that um, there is not always um, a linkage between those who study logistics and such and trade procedures. But if you're uh, working with international transport and distributions, you really have to be aware of these things because in everyday life you will be confronted with customs, border, passing with uh, Inco terms with transport law. Um, before starting, uh, I'd just like to know how any of you been working for uh, shipping companies, freight forwarders uh, and so forth? You? Mm. What uh, company? Compact. Compact? Mm. Kongsberg. Compact, yeah. Mm. Like Kongsberg. Kongsberg, I see, that's interesting. So, uh, so you were on the shipper side then? Mm. Yeah. Anybody else? Hmm? So, um, well, just to have a background, but uh, please, if I, um, if I tend to use words, expressions that you don't understand, don't hesitate to, to ask me. That's, that's the, the challenge of having been in this field for too long. So, let's see how we work it out. Um, what we're going to deal about so is first uh, why and how export import format is matters. And um, then again, s well, that's my, my uh, name, my presentation. So if you have any questions, please uh, don't hesitate to send me an email uh, afterwards. Um, so the, then the agenda of today is first to deal some with the complexities of international trade. And this goes some way in explaining why, uh, for example, from an information IT point of view, international trade and logistics may seem a bit um, conservative or rather paper-based, uh, especially when you compare to uh, internal logistics. And that may be a professional point as well, because many logistical textbooks are uh, um, made in the USA and the United States as such is such a continent and they uh, don't always um, um, they are not so uh, much um, uh, focus on international trade as such 
But um, then customs clearance, of course, you can uh, lecture on this for a week, but I just uh, draw, will draw your attention to some main points. The terms of delivery, Inco terms, uh, this is of major importance uh, for you, uh, at least for those who you are going to work in practical life. And last but not least, some words on international transport laws and uh, transport insurance. So this is today's agenda. I had the opportunity to read some of the, um, the literature in our curriculum, so uh, especially about uh, sea transport, land transport, and, uh, and of course also uh, air transport. So uh, I tried to make some connections, although I haven't read it. I don't know it by heart, to put it that way. Well, this is sort of the ideal situation. It's a UN safe act, it's the United Nations body in Europe has this sh buy ship pay model. I mean, in this simple world, you have a seller and buyer, you have the consignment that uh, is shipped, and um, well, you want, of course, to get paid for, for your goods. But um, in the real world, uh, it's, the picture is much more complex. So one way of looking at this, I wouldn't say it's supply chain in your way because it's a more simple a seller uh, and buyer and you ship the goods in between. But here you prepare for export and the legal fact that you know, the sales contract or the buyer's contract is properly made up, um, that really will define the quality of the supply chain. You course, you have the physical transport as such, when you're providing way bills and um, this kind of stuff. But all, but what we're going to deal, especially with these re regulatory procedures, um, that you you have to uh, take into account, and what is also quite um, interesting in practical life, that there is often a very close connection between shipping the goods and getting paid for the goods. Because in many logistic textbooks, you have a kind of, um, well, shall we put it a bit uh, provocatively, uh, Alice in Wonderland. That the parties got to know each other, they trust each other, they are, uh, and p payment as such is not, mm, not a problem. But as we have seen in this financial crisis, uh, you may have a buyer that is not able to, to pay, and if they really have got the goods, you have no uh, possibilities of uh, getting your payment. So, so, so to say, withholding the shipment, controlling the shipment can be quite a critical issue. Yeah. So, um, so then I said the real life experience, and this uh, will bring you closer to reality. It was uh, a big ship owner, Valenus Willemsen, who um, who really studied uh, transport chain in detail. And they took as a point of departure uh, uh, tractors that were being produced in Mannheim in Germany. And uh, the customers in, in uh, this case was uh, Australian farmers. So they asked and they really counted every operation that they, what did it take to have these tractors uh, delivered physically to, to the farmers. Uh, all in all, 58 different documents had to be produced by all the parties involved. There were 192 activities and uh, there were at least 16 actors. So remember, you have the seller, you have the buyer, you have various transport companies, you have insurance companies, you have banks, you have uh, customs, you may have food inspection and other agencies. So in other cases, it may be even more actors. And although you sit as a shipper or a buyer or have the overall view, you had to make these other parties uh, to, to satisfy their demands as well. And also, and this also goes some way in explaining why international logistics is uh, more uh, traditional in a, way, in a way it's more paper-based, that you had, in this case, 13 different IT systems which didn't necessarily correspond. So, uh, and you also have status points for the strike and tra trace. And then that's also interesting in international trade that you have some uh, black holes, you know, the goods is out there somewhere. Of course, you have the express companies like DHL, TNT, that owns their own means of transport. But as we shall come back to with the transport law, 
with the freight forward, the normal the situation is not that at all. So um, then we come to uh, border crossing. What you do have to do if you're not within a customs union, because if you're in a customs union, it's like traveling with a country um, f fellow. F well, so like you sell being in uh, Norway, you uh, ship goods to Bergen, you buy goods from uh, Tromsø within the country. So that is what it's like if you have a consignment from Stockholm in, in Sweden to Munich in Germany and vice versa. But uh, Norway and many other most countries in the world are not in this customs union. So you have to declare the goods for export. Yeah, may maybe export restrictions. We had a seminar yesterday on uh, Russia. There is still this sort of, sort of um, cold war attitude in some respect that you cannot sell every goods from this country to Russia. There are export restrictions. And uh, also security requirements in the wake of September 11, 2001. Okay, that was the one side of the coin, but then we came to import. You also have import declaration. Um, in other sense, you may have import restrictions. As we saw when dealing with Russia yesterday, for a lot of products you have to, pro you have, to have licenses. For example, importing uh, pharmaceutical products, uh, the importer as such has to be authorized by the authorities. And uh, there may be issues of standards, although you think, well, this is the way we do it. Here in Russia, you have GOST standards in the United States, US standards, which may not comply. And uh, also, you have the security requirements, and you have customs. Um, how about uh, customs? Do you have to pay customs duty or not? And what subraces? We come back to that. You may also be extra fees. Then you have the value added tax. And uh, the interesting things about value added tax is like, if you are not registered and don't get this fund, uh, re this um, fee refunded, it's like you are running 120 meters and your competitor 100 meters. So uh, I come back to that when dealing with the uh, terms of delivery. And last but not least, it's the clearance time. And I would really um, urge you, if you're dealing with international transport, to ask that question. For example, when I was in Kirinagel, we had uh, um, the client that was or a customer that was occupied by door-to-door um, -door consignment to a place in South Africa. The, the main transport as such was not a problem. Remember that the, the big logistic service providers today, they have that uh, they can track down the various uh, offers and you mostly have, you can have the good offer in 10 minutes, just looking at your screen, comparing the prices and so forth. But uh, it took, it can often take days, especially to other more demanding countries in South Africa to find out um, what will be the real cost. And of course, the time to declare the goods in South Africa, well, normally, uh, my colleagues at that time said, you should uh, calculate with three extra days. And uh, I can tell you in many other countries, you, you will use much more time. So these are really important questions to address. And of course, they go back to formalities. For those of you who are interested in this from a more logistical point of view, I would recommend two sources. Um, You have the Logistics Performance Index. It's made up of the World Bank, so you can just Google on that. And uh, there are actually 1,000 freight forwarders, six uh, employees and ex express companies around the world who are, who are asked to assess uh, the efficiency or lack of efficiency for logistics in various countries. Also from uh, the World Bank how is doing business index. I think 186 countries are compared and especially the sub-index called trading across borders.
So this, from a more um, trained logistical point of angle, uh, will uh, show you what is more to, to quantify the, um, the, the costs as well as the time used. Okay, then we go to the bread and butter stuff. Customs tariff. It's a system called the harmonized system. Um, and um, you have an organization called World Customs Organization. And um, most countries in the world use this uh, harmonized system. And that is really very much in our spirit, so to say, in, in Nostella. You have harmonized, you have standardized things. And um, this means that what you, um, the classification you give the goods in Norway, you also have in Egypt, in the United States, in China, and so forth. So this, of course, bring more uh, security. And um, in many countries also, it's, uh, you have a relation with um, export and import um, restrictions. So let's have a look at what this looks uh, look like in, in practice. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Here we are. Okay. This customs code here. This is the HS system, the harmonized system. You first have the very chapter. There are 97 chapters all in all. Then you have the under position, and then you have um, the customs too. So the first six digits are equal in, in uh, most countries, but as you uh, have certainly noticed on many occasions, the, the, the devil's in the details. And fr from the seventh uh, digit on, you have national, uh, the countries are free to, uh, to add um, uh, their own numbers, their own classifications. So for example, in Nor Norwegian system, we have eight uh, numbers. In the EU, you have 10 to 11, depending. In uh, Russia you, and the United States, you have 10. So, um, so um, you have to provide in many countries this, uh, this number. But anyhow, it makes things uh, easier. At least in the countries who have adopted these systems. Uh, at the seminar on, we had on Russia, really, they the Russians seem to uh, have um, another way of classifying this. You have the system, like in the EU, this uh, methodology is very much based on what, in what context do you use these goods? Are they toys? Are they for professional use? Whereas in Russia, for example, you are more, more occupied by the material uh, the goods are made of. That is a way of... Um, um, or categorizing the goods according to the harmonized system as well. But um, this is the kind of information you have to, to provide and that is also in the wake of September 11th that uh, customs authorities have a better possibility to, to check out what, uh, what goods are, there are. So customs evaluation then. Um, in Norway and many countries, historically speaking, uh, customs duties played a, uh, an important role for the national economy. Although it's more marginal now in other countries, uh, it's still a major source of incomes for the state. And uh, therefore also the customs authorities are uh, were anxious not to, to get the necessary means. You have this CIF value, meaning cost insurance freight. We come back to that in terms, meaning that you, your way of calculating is the, the price from uh, the factory as such or the production site. Then you have the transport to the, to, to the border or the um, I importer and also the, um, an insurance value added. So that's the basis on which you do the calculation. Uh, for example, 10% uh, customs rate. Uh, you have that in most countries in the world, but in some countries, for example, like in the United States, in Australia, and some other countries, you, you, um, you have as a basis of calculation FOB value, free on board. 
That means for practical purposes that you delete the transport cost and the insurance cost. So if you have, again back to this 10% uh, customs, it will not normally matter that much. But for example, with Norwegian exporters of stones, where I mean um, for all purposes the transport costs are very heavy and that's a big part of the invoice value. Uh, then it can be quite an advantage. You can imagine these Norwegian exporters competing with a Canadian exporter where they have a, as a point of departure normally a shorter way to the market if uh, the, the buyer is in the United States. You may also calculate according to net and gross weight and um, many food products, some commodities are calculated in this. In Switzerland, for example, you have this gross weight and that may go some way in explaining like, why uh, quite a few exporters when sending goods to, to uh, Switzerland try to make sure that uh, the packaging is as uh, light as possible. So you also combine this value um, then you also have the, when you calculate, you have the transaction value that is normally the sales price. But you also have, uh, will many, much of the world trade today is in between uh, big companies. So then you have the price for similar goods, for example. And, but you do have the, the challenge with uh, unnormal values. Because, for example, Norwegian customs authorities they do have a register, statistically speaking, that uh, your uh, clothes, your uh, PC or whatever should be worth something in the range between this and that value. And uh, for example, when the imports of clothes from China, Bangladesh exploded, there were quite some problems for Norwegian importers because the goods were that cheap that they were, um, so they were, they were below uh, what the price the, sh the price should be according to uh, custom statistics. You also have, on the other hand, some very advanced electronic pro products with a lot of IT knowledge put into them. And say, well, this is not it's a point by just the boat, but uh, the electronic systems, steering systems, are so advanced that they are much worth worth more. Yeah. Okay, so customs evaluation is an important point. Then, and this is important for outsourcing people, and then this is something that uh, uh, people have no idea about customs issues, trying to forget. You, customs people always focus on the physical flood of goods. The so, flow of goods. So, they ask from where it is produced, where it's. Um, sufficiently produced and uh, as I mentioned to you in a customs union you know that's a bit like the castle in the middle age because um, if you're importing in goods into the EU let's say from China there is a common custom tariff perhaps you have 15% of the SIF value and that is irrespective of the country of entry. It may be Germany, it may be France, it may be Sweden, and so forth. So here the, the fence has the same size or tower. Um, whereas on the other hand, in so-called free trade areas, Norway is a member of the free trade area called EFTA, uh, made up of um, Iceland, uh, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, and Norway. But the, the free trade area, EFTA countries have free trade agreement with many other countries. But in, in contrary to a customs union, where this is a common policy, the Swedes can't have a different policy than the Germans and the Italians and so forth, here the, the countries are free to set their own uh, import customs. So for example in Iceland they may be protectionistic, 10%. Norwegians are very nice, no uh, zero uh, customs rate, whereas the Swiss perhaps they have, um, and Swiss and Liechtenstein, they are in, in a kind of customs union, so let's say they have 5%. So this is a basic difference. Mm -hmm. 
But anyhow, you have this country origin. This is a very important question so related to free trade areas. Because you really, if you have a free trade agreement, you are a more privileged partner in the sense that uh, compared to third countries, meaning countries where you have no agreement at all, um, you have um, in many products, especially industrial products, you have a lower tariff right, as, or perhaps also a zero uh, custom right. So, um, for example, if you go into outsourced products, uh, products production of countries, it's an, it really is an important question to ask. Uh, how about the customs from uh, right from importing goods from China versus importing it from Poland? Poland is, for example, a member of the EU. We in Norway have an agreement, the EEA, European Economic Area, uh, AOS in Norwegian. So it means for most pro products, zero customs, whereas from China it might be 10%, even 15%. And if and uh, quite a few of those who do outsourcing try tend to forget about this. So, um, therefore, the country of origin is extremely important. And you really have, if you go into the web page of efta.int. You can find this various free trade agreement and it's especially the so-called list rules where and the key word is here sufficiently processed. And speaking of sufficiently processed, you go back to the customs tariffs, the first two or the four uh, numbers, uh, and uh, then you have various rules here that if they are sufficiently pro processed or not. And some countries even have a kind of um, Statistics for the countries uh, where they are, you may call them underprivileged or are considered uh, uh, very competitive, too competitive. Uh, again, to go back to this seminar in Russia that we held yesterday, uh, it, for example, Chinese exporters to our goods to, to Russia, they are faced with a customs that on many occasions is 50% higher than Norwegian exporters. Hmm. So then, but also you have to prove this that uh, you are, so to say, in a, in a favorable group with this proper certificate of origin in order to obtain customs preferences. And then this is a conflict within many companies because you know the salespeople, the purchasing people say, well. They are producing things that are extremely uh, cheap in, in China or any other countries, but they don't perhaps take into account that there uh, may be customs uh, occurring because, uh, at least at the time being, uh, Norway and China, EFTA and China don't have a free trade agreement. So, therefore, the country origin is of importance. So, here you see the, the more practical example. We take as a point of point a very fairly well-known product, paint. Um, this producer here has chosen to, to outsource uh, part of the products from pigments and some other ingredients uh, coming from China. CN is the ISO abbreviation for China. And um, there is actually some... Uh, but this uh, product does not have... Um, um, customs to, to Norway, they are producing them in Norway and then reselling them to Italy. So, you see, in this occasion there will be no customs because Norway is uh, a member of the EEA, also with Italy as an EU member. Whereas, on the other side, we can imagine that there is a Chinese competitor here. But as uh, Italy dash EU and China do not have any free trade agreement. Um, the Italian importer in this case had to pay 6.5% 6, 6 uh, customs based on the SIF value. Of course, there may be in other cases where Norway is not a privileged nation. I mentioned North America. Uh, United States of America has a free trade agreement with uh, Canada and Mexico. And in that sense, this um, Producers from these countries may have an advantage as they 
more likely will have zero customs rate than Norwegian uh, exporters. Yeah. Then, um, what we work for very much in um, Nostella is the so-called single window approach. Um, as I mentioned to you, um, you often have many parties involved in international trade and also when it comes to public authorities. You don't always have, uh, well you think of the customs officials, they are physically on the border, you have the food inspection uh, for, uh, well, for environmental uses, for uh, other uses. And um, um, here again you can see a picture of this. You have these various uh, institutions and they are not always working hand in hand. They may, as a matter of fact, uh, work in, uh, quite separately. So you don't have to just stop once, twice, t three times. What one is aiming for in trade facilitation, which we in, in uh, Nostella very much involved, is to make this more simple. So that you as an exporter or importer just have to face one authority. Uh, so you see, and um, most likely if you can, d you can do that, you, uh, it will be the customs that will be physically present at the borders and might also have the IT system. For example, in Norway, um, one may complain about the bureaucracy in this country as well, but um, the Norwegian Directorate of Customs and Excise, they are, they are um, acting on behalf of some 20 uh, Norwegian public agencies. So, in, as far as it goes like this, you just have to face the customs authority and behind the curtain, so to say, they interact with other uh, public bodies. And this is very important and you can also read this in the logistics performance index or in a, perhaps especially in doing business. Because one had, uh, according to estimations b being done, in average on a global scale, two thirds of the time you use when passing borders is either due to other agencies and the customs agencies or to, due to lack of cooperation between these agencies. Um, to give you a practical example, um, Malaysia adopted this single window approach some years ago and uh, the average times for uh, declaring goods for import was reduced from seven to two days. So this does really matter and uh, this is also an important question when it comes to outsourcing and I think this goes some way in explaining why China has been more successful than India for example because in India you still have very bureaucratic routines and lack of predi predictability if you're outsourcing, uh, if you're for example in the fashion industries you know that time to market is critical and uh, if you don't have the clothes there on an exhibition, I mean, that could be a catastrophe. Uh, and uh, that, for example, has turned out to be a, quite a challenge when outsourcing production to, to India. Can I, can I yeah? ask a question? Yeah? You, you said that, uh, well, it would be good if you have a single window approach and you, mm -hmm. you sort of arrange all these things into yeah. one. Uh, the World Trade Organization, for instance, works to lower barriers to trade. Yeah. Uh, but the main focus is on, on tariffs and, and customs and things like that. Couldn't this also be that some nations actually don't want to simplify this and they use that mm. as a protectionistic yeah. uh, thing? Do you have any comments on that? Yes, we'll call, well, you always have this pressure. Um, Brazil is a, a, a current example, especially for Norwegian oil and gas business. But um, they have the so-called import substitution policy that they wanted to build up their own industry. And they still have this uh, protectionist reflex. So if, if some foreign supplier uh, threaten uh, Brazilian companies, we have seen over and over again that all of a sudden the customs rate, whoop, oh, up it goes. And uh, that much that uh, you have problem in competing. You always see also in Brazil have uh, this uh, demand for local content, meaning that you have to make um, 
Ma many products, uh, the, the um, production value 80%, 70% had to be of Brazilian value. And you also see this in Brescia today, that I'm a member of the WTO, but uh, uh, there are many Russian companies who have problems facing competitions. So, um, so you, you still have these uh, rather uh, rigid border controls uh, and um, you have this uh, demand for a license and so forth and uh, make it rather comprehensive. So um, this can make it rather risky to, um, to uh, choose uh, Russian business partner. Within the framework of WTO though, there is um, a strong movement also for making a more comprehensive agreement on trade facilitation. And if you're uh, fo following the news, there's going to be a big uh, WTO meeting on in Bali in December. And um, if we're lucky, we come up with a trade f uh, facilitation agreement that it's much more um, detailed than it used to be. But um, there are also strong protectionist uh, pressure. The, the, the snag is also, you know, you can always say that from the health, environmental and security point of view, this is uh, most legitimate to have customs control. And in quite a few cases you can see, you can very argue for, for doing that, but you also see that this is a pretext for having uh, tra extra trade barriers. Extra controls. Any other questions as to this? Mm. I also mentioned here another phenomenon and that you have in international trade, you have bonded warehouses, or you also have free trade zones. So that means, from so to say, a customs perspective, that this free trade zone is a sort of foreign country within the country. So uh, many countries are used as a uh, um, part of that trade policy to to, um, to to market that to foreign companies. You come to our countries, to establish a company in this free trade zone, and we make sure there will be no taxes, no customs, as long as you're uh, in that <coughs> zone. Um, that's had some attractions, but of course um, you have to have stable uh, framework for doing that as well. Mm. Okay. Then we come to um, my final fall here is this terrorist threat. Um, what used to be the case, I mean, Historically speaking, and the customs was concerned about uh, the state revenues and uh, historically now in many Western countries, especially the, the money gets f f from, from customs rate is uh, much less important. Uh, although in many development countries it still plays a role. And then you also have this more public uh, uh, taking care of the public uh, in a way that you don't produce uh, food that uh, makes people sick and plants that uh, will be out of control and so forth. But after um, September 11, 2001, you also have this terrorist perspective. And then you had uh, what's coming up here in uh, international trade this. What do you? called uh, security. The point really, the, one of the, the main philosophy behind this uh, is to stop the goods as early as possible in the supply chain. So if you, s and you can imagine here you have a supply chain and uh, there might be some border crossing here. Yeah. What uh, you would really like to have is to have um, perhaps an authorization of the various uh, actors to see that they have security in place. And that goes uh, as far to both physical security, that they have routines, that they have um, transparency so you can look into their uh, um, 
counting the information and so forth. So the, the philosophy then really, if you're uh, accredited, for example, this AEO authorized economic operator, you'll get a sort of credit in the sense that the customs will look not so much into your uh, business as if you were not that. And that goes for transport companies and so forth. So you may say, idly speaking, if, if everybody here is accredited, you should have less border control, you should be though also, commercially speaking, able to, to, uh, to um, promote uh, that you have a better delivery service. Alas, in practice, it has not been that easy, and that perhaps is also because the customs authorities are pretty conservative and they have their control routines and uh, they don't. All the and um, you do have risk assessment programs, but um, but uh, they, they all don't always work. But uh, this is um, very important. So, I mean, if you really have uh, something here, and well, especially if this is in the United States, you t you tr trying to track if it's so it's the explosion here finds pla takes place in the middle of Atlantic. Of course, it will be uh, very bad for those on the ship. But if it if this is in New York, uh, it won't happen here. So. But ideally speaking, you should, if you have a terrorist placing a bomb here, that uh, you should have the routines that you get aware of this on an early stage. Uh, one of the so I'll say most recent episode in this drama was in um, um, you had uh, some powder actually to be used for refill power in um, in copy machines. And that uh, the country of origin was in Yemen, and uh, what this was apparent powder was not ordinary powder. This was sort of gunpowder, so it was meant to explode somewhere in the USA. But uh, in the Champot chain here, it was a very uh, it was a freight forwarder in the UK, so they had some very good routines, and uh, they tracked down that and they managed to stop uh, this uh, consignment. So anyhow, this uh, terrorist threat and uh, the way to secure it is, uh, uh, has been a very dominant issue in international trade policy since 2001. What is a challenge though, uh, for the industry is that you have various bodies. I can just give you a Norwegian example here. Uh, you can find similar uh, in other countries. You have the customs authorities that uh, will make checks. You can go into the, the port of Molde here. You can say RSPS. Uh, that is uh, the port is secured according to international safe port uh, s procedures. That is the IMO, the International Maritime Organization. And then you go for air transport. You have um, ICAO and you have EU rules, you have American rules, so you really have different uh, regimes. And uh, what we are trying to be doing in, um, in Nostella is to lobby for the governments to, uh, to, uh, to cooperate. So in the sense that if you, if you have a security regime on board in your company, you should be accredited for that in the sense that you easier get the other authorizations as well. And there's been some movement in that direction. Any questions as to b passing on borders, customs? Mm -hmm. Do anybody write about this t topic in your... Uh, mm? I think so. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the Brazilian case. We have a couple of Brazilian students here. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Is this about tolls and things? Is this something that you you've noticed that uh, that there is a discussion on how open the borders should be for imports and things like that? Oh, yeah. Actually, we did a, uh, yeah. a project on this, uh, but uh, it's, it's really interesting to know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, uh, the Brazilian is trying to improve the industry uh, mm -hmm. of oil, and you have a lot of importations of. 
eye and stuff like that. It's, our eye is not good, but we're not approaching as like mm. that. Yeah, well, uh, there are at least four different customs procedures when importing goods to to uh, Brazil, and uh, there are some uh, sort of say are privileges because they are uh, they have Petrobras as a customer, and you know that's much like Statoil in in Norway. Yeah. Kanske slår den nu. Ja, den kan bara lägga ner.